Hello everyone and welcome to our evening service in Brotty Ferry Presbyterian Church. I feel quite at home sitting here in my lounge, but I'd really rather be in a church service with you all. But since we can't do that, we look forward to that day, we're nevertheless grateful that we can be together to worship, pray and listen to God's word because of the internet. So if you're regularly with us, or if this is perhaps just your very first time, I hope that you'll feel at home in our service and that we'll all find it a rich blessing as we join together in worship. Our theme this evening is Jesus is the true shepherd, the good shepherd who searches out and cares for his sheep. So our call to worship is based on John chapter 10 and verse 11 where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So we begin our service singing about the Good Shepherd who laid down his life, who became sin for us, who took the blame, who bore the wrath that we might be forgiven at the cross. So let's sing together, O oh, to see the dawn.
let's come to God with our prayers of adoration and confession. Let's pray. Almighty and most gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening with awe and wonder, for there is no one like you, none with whom we can compare you. You are the God who is perfect in your purity and holiness, majestic in your might and power, righteous in your rule and justice. You are the God who is generous in your grace and goodness, wonderful in your love, and how we thank you for the Lord Jesus, who took our place upon the cross, who paid the price for our sins, who took the blame and bore the wrath that we might be forgiven. We thank you that he is the good shepherd who comes to seek and to save us, to rescue us, redeem us, and reconcile us to yourself. We worship and thank you for your great love, our Father, and we love you because you first loved us. And yet we don't always live out that love as we should do. We confess that sometimes we do and think and say things that offend you and grieve you. Sometimes the things we say or do hurts others and causes them pain. We confess that sometimes our longings and desires are more for the things of this world than they are for the things of heaven and our motives are not pure and selfless. So in longing and desire, in speech and thought, in word and in action we have sinned against you and we need your forgiveness, our Father. Forgive us, we pray, all our sins and our shortcomings and help us to follow Jesus our Shepherd as he leads us in paths of righteousness. We come and we ask these things, our Father, not because of any merit of our own, but pleading only the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ our Saviour, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Good evening. It's nice to be with you again, and I'm going to be reading from Ezekiel chapter 34, and we're going to read the first 16 verses. So I'll give you a moment to turn that up. And whenever you're ready, just hold up your finger and I'll know you're right with me. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered, because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, Surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Behold I am against the shepherds and I will require my sheep at their, their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold I, I may, myself will search for my sheep, will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the, mountains, on, on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. This is the word of the Lord and may his name be praised. Let us bow together in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal loving God, we are so delighted to be able to be in communication with you, even during these troublous times, separated as we are from the joint fellowship together, we are still able to meet in a different way and yet, Lord, still do exactly the same as we did in church. Bring ourselves into your presence in worship as well as in prayer especially and talk to you about some of the concerns that we have on our heart. First of all, we would like to be, for you to know that we, we are filled with praise and, and honour at being in your presence, and yet we have the, the ability to do so through the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who gave his life as a ransom for many, and that many included our own personal name, that we've been drawn into your kingdom, that we are part of the family, that we are adopted into God's forever family, and that's a rare privilege. And that even us can come into your presence and just tell you how we feel. We can share the burdens that we have. Maybe it's the burden of loneliness or alienation. Maybe there are things going on in our families that, 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 are, that are really troublesome. And so we ask, Lord, that you would bring peace to all of our hearts and that all of those difficult situations that surround us, maybe there are things going on that we can't even begin to communicate into that family. And so we ask, Lord, that by your inspiration, that we would have the right words to say with the right words to share, even if it's just over the telephone. We want to bring harmony and peace into these difficult situations. And so, Lord, we, we are aware today, of course, that there are people who are seriously hurting. We think of the grieving in our community, those people who have been saddened by the, the deaths that have occurred during this crisis, and all of the attendant crisis that, that that brings to people having not been there with their loved one. And so, Lord, we ask and pray that if there is a way that you could open a door for us to show the love of Christ into that situation, to bring comfort, to bring the assistance that, that Lord, that you would want us to do so that that person does not feel so lost, or hurting, or angry, but bring peace. Lord, we also re realize that, you know, there are people who, because of the way they feel they've been treated in churches, or by Christian people, well-meaning probably every time, but there are people who have been hurting and feel that the only way that they could deal with it was to draw back, to hide away to move to a different place altogether. And so we pray, Lord, this evening hour, that again we pray for your peace in their heart, that there will be a measure of forgiveness, that there would be a move forward so that people can come together and be reconciled again, one with the other. Lord Jesus, this is your church. We are thankful for it. We're thankful for the pastors who lead. We thank you for their commitment during this difficult time and what they've been able to facilitate for all of us. And we are grateful. We thank you for the office bearers and for all of them, the office bearers, the elders, as well as the pastors as they make plans for how we will likely begin to get back together again as a worshiping fellowship. We pray for insight, wisdom, we pray for good guidance, not only biblically, but also maybe scientifically, which seems strange, but both are gifts that are given by God. And so we pray, Father, that in your great wisdom, that you would impart what is needed to help us to be safe, to help us to be sensitive, to realize that we are to love the Lord with all our heart and our neighbor as ourself. And maybe one of the best ways that we can love our neighbour in these days is by making sure that we keep safe, and they will too. And so, Lord, we ask your blessing upon us. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord and the head of the church, and the King who is seated at your right hand, Father. It's in his name and for his sake that the glory may be yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing again now. This time we're going to sing Yet Not I. This is a new song to most of us, but it's one that's rich in biblical truth with wonderful, wonderful words. Each refrain is slightly different, but each one begins, To this I hold, and ends with the words, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. In the second refrain, we'll sing, To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Because it's a new song, the plan is to hear the first verse so we can familiarise ourselves with the tune, 
and then we'll go back to the beginning and hopefully we'll be able to join together and sing, Yet Not I.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Kieran Kelleher. Uh, I serve as uh, the assistant pastor of the congregation here, and it's wonderful uh, to be with you. Um, if you could please open back up to Ezekiel chapter 34. We're going to continue uh, where we finished our reading earlier on. We're going to uh, take it up. So we're reading verses 17 through to the end of the chapter, uh, which is verse 31. So Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 17 through to verse 31. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet. And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad, I will rescue my flock they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I the Lord will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing, and I will send down the showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in their land, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and deliver them from the hand of those who enslave them. They shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will provide for them renowned plantations, so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land, and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them, and that, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture. And I am your God, declares the Lord God. And this is the word uh, of the Lord God. Um, let's pray together before we begin. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of your wisdom and understanding, that being taught by you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. The church, the, the people of God, is meant to be a, a sanctuary a refuge for people, a place of, of peace and hope and joy. But for far too many people, that has not been the case. Uh, so if you were one of those people who comes here and has been bruised and burned by church leaders, those who have old and deep scars, let me say welcome to you. Uh, this passage here is, a, is an invitation, it is a call to the downtrodden, the neglected and the wounded. It is for those who have been abandoned or abused by those called to serve and care for God's people. God the shepherd here is speaking to his people, inviting them and calling them back into the fold into the place where he himself 
provides grace, love and healing for his own people. Um, If you've been with us for uh, the last couple of months, we've been working through Ezekiel. uh, And we've seen uh, that this is uh, written to a people who had abandoned their God, who had turned away from him, from the paths of life and righteousness, uh, into uh, a place of rebellion uh, against the one who rescued and sustained them. Uh, And where we are this week, is this is coming after uh, the city of Jerusalem, uh, the home of the people whom uh, Ezekiel is speaking and writing to here, has been destroyed totally. The temple has been raised, the walls have been knocked down. Uh, There is no food, there is no riches, there is no hope for anyone who lives in that place or for those who have been exiled. Uh, The last uh, residue of their hope has been taken from them. And we come now to this final section of the book. This is from from chapters 34 all the way to 48. And this is where God steps in and says, I am the hope of my people. And he is going to show them how he is going to restore them. And we're going to see all these different examples over the next five weeks, including tonight, of how God is going to restore his people. Uh, And what we're going to see throughout is uh, God is going to take the promises that he has given to his people. uh, And they are going to go up and up and up. They're greater than they ever were before. And what we're going to see that in the person of Jesus, they're greater than we could ever have imagined. Uh, this evening, uh, we, uh, our passage is based around a, a sharp contrast, uh, and that's going to shape our outline this evening. So we've got two big points this evening, uh, and the first one here is we see the bad shepherds. So we've got the contrast, the first part of that contrast is the bad shepherds, and we see here they're the ones who serve and supply themselves. The bad shepherds who serve and supply themselves. Um, The job of a shepherd uh, is simple and it can be summed up in one way uh, uh, with three points. Shepherds are meant to protect their flock from uh, danger. They are meant to provide for their flock, to nourish them. And they are meant to guide their flock to places of safety and security. Um, All throughout the the ancient periods, Kings and religious leaders were spoken of in terms of uh, of shepherds. Uh, they used the language that was normally used for shepherds for the role that they were to carry out uh, as rulers of their people. Uh, and that's the same in the biblical narrative. All the way throughout, you get literal examples where uh, Moses and David, who were shepherds themselves, were called into positions of leadership. Uh, and all the way throughout, They are spoken of as shepherds. But what we see here is the leaders of the people of God. They had abdicated their responsibilities and they had failed in all three of those fronts. And this is both uh, the kings of Israel, those who would uh, fraternize with surrounding nations and the priests and the false prophets who had flirted with the gods of other nations. What they have all done is they have surrendered their duty to serve the flock whom they had been put over to serve. And what we see is that they are selfish and neglectful of their responsibilities. First, we see that they are those who um, only care about their own self-interests. Um, have a look with me again at verses uh, 18 to 19. Uh, and th- look at the imagery that's used here. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of the pasture and to drink of clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water? Do, do you see that, uh, that picture and imagery that's being used there? That's in their pursuit to uh, satisfy their hunger, to quench their thirst. Uh, They've muddied the rest 
of the options for the rest of the people. So when the others come to get what they need, they are only left with dirty afterthoughts. Um, it's a little bit, it was a little bit like, wasn't it? Do you remember at the beginning, just before lockdown began, and there was this great crush and surge at the supermarkets? Remember those people who, in the, the confusion and the panic, they stormed the supermarkets, clearing out the shelves, leaving key frontline workers without basic uh, necessities. So they, they are those who look out for their own interests and they, and they are also those who protect their own interests. It, that's the same, isn't it, for nowadays. Whereas these, to make sure that they got to their own, they muddied the rest so that no one else could get there. You think of nowadays, don't you, where leaders who, when accusations are made against them or those who are part of their inner circle, they sweep those accusations under the carpet. Or they even discredit the victim so that their name might not be tarnished. So that, they, uh, that their reputation in their community or in the media might not be stained. But the problem is there, is the concern is not for the victim, for the one who is hurt, the one who needs healing, but it is only for themselves and for those who are close by them. So they are those who look out for their own interests and they also neglect the interests of others. They don't nourish or nurture those who are under their care. You, you see here, it speaks uh, about how they didn't feed the people of God. Uh, they didn't do the job that they had been called to. Um, throughout the scriptures, to, to feed God's people means to preach God's words to them. Uh, Peter, one of the apostles, Jesus told him that his job as a shepherd was to feed the sheep, which was to give the word. That is how we encounter Jesus. That is how we know God is through his word. That is how we are spiritually nourished and how we grow. And that is what God's leaders were meant to do. The kings, the priests and the prophets were all to be ministers for him to feed their people. But they had neglected that. It's like those, again, still in the modern church who do not teach the whole counsel of God. That is what we're commanded to do. Yet some neglect that because it might, again, tarnish their reputation. It might bring heat upon them to teach some parts of God's truth which is uncomfortable for the world and makes their lives uncomfortable in return. And that is neglecting the duty that God has called his shepherds to do. And what happens then by neglecting the interests of others, they leave them vulnerable and, uh, and they become prey for others. Um, have a look with me at verse 5. There's a, a great, uh, this is a very helpful, succinct way of summing it up. So the people, because of the actions of the leaders and their, in, and their inactions, the people have been scattered because there was no shepherd and they have become food for all the wild beasts. You see, the danger there, isn't it, is that, uh, that when God's people are not being shepherded, they then become Pray for the wider world, where they'll become susceptible to the voices of the wider world, be consumed by false teaching and a false gospel. And that's the danger there, that there's, uh, this, they become prey to those uh, outside the church, but also inside the church. Have a look again at verse 18 with me. Isn't that enough for you to feed on the good pasture? that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture. And here, uh, the ones he's speaking to here, it's probably not the kings, but it's uh, the ones lower down, the other kind of leaders in, in the society. 
Uh, and because the kings have not ruled what is going on, these um, lower upper classes, uh, they have taken advantage. Uh, and so it's even within the church, within the people of God, people become prey to others who would try to take all that which is good. And so we see the kings and the leaders of Israel, they've become deformed. Uh, they now no longer reflect their gods, but are an ugly image of the world. The leaders of Israel have actually become like the world itself. Um, if you have a look of me there, I think it's in uh, verse 4, towards the end of verse 4. And you see this, that they, uh, the way they have led is with force and harshness you have ruled them. With harshness. Um, that word, the word harshness, is only ever used, is only, uh, the only other time that it's used in the scriptures is way back in Exodus chapter 1 to describe how Egypt uh, acted as slave masters over the people of Israel. And so the picture we get here then is the leaders of Israel have become like those who used to oppress them. Uh, even though they had been rescued by, by God out of bondage of slavery, they've gone back and done that to their own people. Um, uh, let me read to you what one commentator has said this, and I think this is a really profound point. He says this, Abusing others is an expression of the arrogant assumption that power is primarily privilege rather than responsibility. And that's a dangerous... Uh, many times when we get power, we think it's to be used for ourselves rather than to benefit those around us, rather uh, than the gifts that have been given for us are meant to be used for the common good of God's people. But they had uh, forgotten that. Maybe they'd even refused to accept that. Um, I grew up in a church uh, that was uh, perfunctory and robotic at best. Uh, and no point was um, a love for Jesus stirred up in those who were part of it. A desire to know God through his word wasn't um, cultivated or modelled. Uh, and all that did was it led me and all of my peers to walk a long, long way, not just from the church, but from Jesus himself. And it was only in my... Uh, early 20s when I was invited to another church and the second week I went a pastor came up and spoke to me and he said Kieran wasn't it you were here last week and in that moment I knew that I was known and that I belonged you see in many churches that isn't the case but for God's people we are to remember that we are known and that we belong with God, our shepherd. And this is uh, one of the things I want us to see. There's three things that we are called to remember here in this first point. We are called to remember that we belong to another. We belong to someone else. You see, as we said, the leaders here, they had forgotten or, or ignored who the flock truly belonged to. Uh, you see, the pictures all the way um, throughout uh, the, the history of the people of Israel is that the leaders, the kings, the priests, the prophets, whoever it was, they were only ever under shepherds. They served the true shepherd, the true God, the true ruler, the true king, the true Lord of lords. And the problem was, is that they had forgotten that and they believed the people belonged to them, not to him. But we remember that the church has been bought with the blood of God the Son, Jesus the Messiah, so that we belong to him and him alone. We belong to him. 
It's like that, uh, the great opening question of the Heidelberg Catechism, what is your only comfort in life and death? And it begins as this, that I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. You see, we belong to him and we remember this because we see here throughout the passage 15 times God says, these are my sheep, my flock, my people. Uh, that repetition is, is important uh, and I think it's, uh, it's been done on purpose because God wants to remind them that they belong to him. And so anybody who does something against his people, they will find themselves in the end of his judgment. And that's the second thing we remember is that God will judge the bad shepherds. God is going to judge them here. If you see that right there at the end of verse 16, uh, God says this. Uh, he says, I will strengthen the weak and then... And the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Because they belong to God. God cares for them. Uh, and God will free them and release them from those who oppress them and abuse and neglect them. And he will punish them because he is just and righteous. So he will judge them. Uh, and maybe this is something just to pause here this is a reminder to those of us who have been called into positions of leadership within uh, Christ's church um, in 1 Peter chapter 5 we're reminded that to be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care we must do this uh, not because we must but because we are willing not pursuing uh, dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to us, but being examples of the flock. You see, we're reminded as, as the leaders of God's people that this isn't our church. We can never speak of my people, but we speak of his people. Because we didn't shed blood for them he did by sending his son to rescue them and so we are called to be under shepherds who follow in the way of Jesus because Jesus and we remember this Jesus came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many we are called to serve in the likeness of Jesus to follow at the pattern and the paradigm that he has set for us as shepherds of his people Jesus is the good shepherd because he lays down his life for his people so that they might have life and we are called to follow him in that way and that's our second point we've seen the bad shepherds this big contrast in this he, they are contrasted then with the good shepherd the good shepherd and the good shepherd we see here he promises to do three things. He promises to rescue, to regather, and restore. So that is the good shepherd promises to rescue, regather, and restore. Um, so have a look at me at verse 11. So we get all these, we, we, up to that point in the first 10 verses, we've seen all of these awful abuses by the shepherds of Israel. And in verse 11, we get this stunning statement by God, where he says, behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. You see, God is gonna be the one who is gonna come in and rescue his people because he knows them. He loves them. They are the ones who in his grace and in his love, he has rescued and set apart to be his people, to be a beacon of his uh, mercy and grace to the watching world. He is 
the one who's going to do it because he's the one that knows them. Um, I, th- I think it's helped. Uh, I remember uh, uh, a few years ago reading a book by Douglas, Douglas Macmillan. Uh, he was a former free church minister. Uh, he, b- before he became a free church minister, he was actually a shepherd himself. And he wrote this beautiful uh, meditation on Psalm 23. If you ever get a chance, it's worth uh, guessing yourselves, the Lord my shepherd. But he speaks of how after he had uh, given up his time as a shepherd, he'd sold his sheep to uh, another shepherd. And one time he was on the train coming back from Edinburgh from his studies uh, and he looked out from the train and he saw some sheep and he knew them because they were his. He could t- he, straight away seeing them, he could say the names of the ones that he saw because they were his And that's the same for God. He knows his people. And he says, I am going to be their shepherd myself because I know them and I'm going to rescue them. And here we've kind of got these great pictures of the the Exodus. Um, All throughout the the story of the Exodus and their time in the wilderness, uh, the language uh, and the uh, pictures of the shepherd were applied to God himself. As he, uh, as he uh, rescued them, as he led them, as he guided them, as he protected them, as he uh, provided for them. God himself steps in uh, and he rescues his people. And all those who are lost, he seeks them out. I will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. It's like that parable that Jesus told, isn't it? Uh, When he is questioned by the religious leaders of his own day, why does he uh, spend time with sinners and tax collectors? And he gives, he tells a story of a shepherd who leaves behind the 99 to go find the one because he knows that one he loves that one he cherishes that one and he will do whatever he can to rescue them because he is their shepherd and he owns that sheep and that is a picture of how God is towards his people he loves us He cherishes us, not because of anything within ourselves, but because of his grace, heart of love and mercy towards us. And so God rescues, uh, he promises to rescue his people, and he's also going to regather his people. Um, Have a look with me again at verse 16. Uh, Verse 16, I will seek out the lost, I will bring back the strays, And I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. You see there, he will bring back the strays. Uh, He doesn't just uh, rescue people out of bondage uh, of sin. Uh, He doesn't just uh, uh, save people from slavery. But he brings them back to uh, be within his fold again. To be in a place of security, of refuge, of joy, of love and of hope and what he's going to do then is he's going to bring them all back together and he's going to establish over them his his perfect and true under shepherd have a look there at verse 23 with me and i will set up over them one shepherd my servant david and he will feed them he shall feed them and be their shepherd. Uh, So what God is saying is that he is going to put over a new king over his people, one who comes from the line of David. Uh, And in John's Gospel, chapter 10, uh, which uh, we began the service with, Jesus says that he himself is that shepherd. And he is God come in the flesh. And he is also in the line of David. And he uses this exact language where he says that there will be one flock and one shepherd, and that is Jesus himself. So Jesus says that, and actually the irony is, is that 
as God goes out to uh, bring back those who were scattered, he does that in one of the strangest of ways. Uh, Because if we um, follow through the storyline of Scripture, uh, in the book of Acts, we see that the people of God were persecuted by the religious leaders of their days to the point where they were scattered and had to leave Jerusalem once again. And the great irony is, is that by the people being scattered by more persecution from the, from the supposed shepherds of Israel, they go out and gather in and reach out to those lost sheep and all the other nations. Um, have a look with me again at verse uh, 5 uh, of this chapter. Uh, you see that there, verse 5. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And then listen to this from Matthew chapter 9. This is about Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew recognises that Jesus here is the fulfilment of the shepherd that we see in Ezekiel 34. Jesus, when he looks over the crowds, he sees people who have been neglected, uh, abused, by their leaders and he has great compassion for them the compassion word there is so strong it talks about a a deep burning uh, pain in the stomach something that would cause you to bend over with uh, with real and pertinent emotion because he sees a people who have been abandoned and neglected by those who were meant to feed them to look after them, to protect them, to guide them. And when Jesus then says, what we should do is we should pray for more workers, for more shepherds to go out. And so that's one of the things that we uh, should do in response to this, is we are called to pray that Jesus, the chief shepherd, would uh, qualify and commission and send out more shepherds into the harvest field to call people back, those who have been burned, those who have been bruised, those who have been hurt and scarred and wounded by the church. We are to call to go out with compassion, with grace, with empathy, pointing people to the chief shepherd, not to ourselves, but to him who loved us and gave himself for us. Uh, And finally, we see just... Very finally, so he is, God promises to rescue us, which he has done in Jesus, releasing us from the bondage of sin. He, he regathers us under Jesus as the shepherds uh, in, a, in a place of, uh, of uh, security, of solace, of hope for his people. And finally, he promises to restore his people. Um, Have a look with me at verse 25. Uh, From verse 25 right to the end, we see this picture of God restoring his people under uh, his shepherding of them. He says, I will make a covenant of peace. I will make with them a covenant of peace. Uh, And what it means there to make a covenant of peace with the people of Israel. He says he's going to banish wild peace from the land. So he's going to make a place of security. It will also be a place of abundance. Have a look at verse 26. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. They will be showers of blessing. And the trees of the fields will yield their fruit. So we see fruitfulness and abundance and riches for God's people. And there will also be those who are released from slavery. You see what God is going to do is the people, because of their sin, in Ezekiel, uh, the people that Ezekiel says, because of their sin, the people have become poor. They have lost their temple, they've lost their city, they've lost their home. And what God says is he is going to restore that for his people. Uh, And what we see when we work our way through scripture is that promise is made even greater because we see that that promise is is fulfilled in Jesus and the work that he is going to do when he totally renews creation, where he makes a new heavens and a new earth where only righteousness dwells, 
where grace rules, where no sin is present and staining, where there is no disharmony and disunity, but where we are brought together as one body under one shepherd, uh, enjoying all the riches that he gives to his people. So let me finish the way we, way we began. Uh, if you're one of those people who has been burned or bruised because of those who are in church leadership, uh, let me say this is the invitation to you to come back, not because of us. Um, we as church leaders, we're still uh, sinful, we're still imperfect, but come back because Jesus, the true shepherd, is calling his people to be back in relationship with him. Uh, and for those of us who already know him and have heard the voice of Jesus and has followed him, we are called to go out into the world with the compassion that he has shown uh, and to point people to him as the only hope where we can be released from the burdens of this world uh, and to take on his grace and his love for ourselves. Let's pray together. God, our Father, uh, we thank you for these wonderful and joyous promises that we find within your word. Uh, and we uh, sing with praise knowing that you have fulfilled them in Jesus, your son, who is our chief shepherd, our good shepherd, the one who laid down his life so that we might have life, the one who uh, bled on the cross so that we might be brought out of the dominion of darkness and sin and brought into the kingdom of light, life and love. Um, help us to have compassion for the world, for those who have been hurt by the church. And let us repent uh, for the pain that has been caused. And we pray that you would help us to seek out and to speak words of healing and of grace to the world. And we pray that you would call more of your people from the wider nations to come back uh, to serve you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, we're going to finish, uh, we're going to have a song now in response to this. We're going to be singing the Lord, my shepherds. Um, Martin Luther spoke about one of the greatest and most wonderful privileges of being a Christian is to say that God is my shepherd, that he is my God because he has known us and loved us and freed us to be his. So please do join in singing the Lord, my shepherd.
Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. 